Good morning. I'm Barb Krauss Blackney, president of ADVIS, and I also want to recognize our partners for this session today, um, Pays Boa and Aggie Malter, executive director, who will, you will hear from at the conclusion of today's uh, webinar and live in-person session. And I also want to thank and welcome uh, PAIS and new executive, interim executive director, Gary Niels, who I believe is online with us today. Uh, as we get started, I wanna ask everyone in the room to kindly silence your cell phones, any other device that you brought with you today. And for those joining us via Zoom online, let you know that uh, you have the ability to type any questions you may have in the chat function, and we will be monitoring them here in the room and uh, delivering them to our speaker as appropriate. Uh, some of you, or may hopefully most of you in the room are aware that there was a story on uh, public radio, both in the immediate Philadelphia region and also in the Harrisburg region over the summer about um, private schools, not uh, solely independent schools, but private schools in general use of the tax credit scholarship programs. And it became apparent to us that there were some misunderstandings really on both sides of the report about what is required to be reported. Um, and also it became very apparent to us the importance of accurate reporting and having the different offices that work with this program in our schools on the same page about that. And in this case, even some reports that aren't directly related to the program were used uh, to try to corroborate information. So we thought it would be really um, important to get everyone in the same room at the same time, whether live and in person or virtually, uh, from the three offices, the enrollment management, the business office, and the development office that work with this program uh, to hear this important information about the guidelines and the reporting requirements and the cycle for these two tax credit programs. And we're very fortunate uh, to welcome back Jim O'Donnell, who um, actually has presented for ADVIS development officers about the program in the past. And uh, Jim uh, has over 15 years of Commonwealth experience at the Department of Community and Economic Development, and in particular, managing the educational tax credit programs. Um, he is the director of the tax credit division since 2012, and um, is directly responsible for administering eight separate tax credit programs, totaling over 295 million in tax credit awards annually. So without further ado, I wanna turn this over to Jim O'Donnell. Will you please uh, join me in welcoming and thanking him for driving down from Harrisburg. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming today. Um, what I plan to do as far as throughout the course of the next hour, hour and a half, I'm going to start with uh, an overview of EITC and the OSTC programs for a lot of you in the room who, who I recognize names and, and you've been involved for many, many years. A lot of you know this information that I'm going to provide. Um, it's just a refresher for yourselves and maybe for some of the new people who aren't 100% familiar with the particulars of the program and the purpose and the mission of EITC and OSTC um, to get an understanding um, of that as well. I also plan to then talk about the renewal season, which a lot of you are aware is coming up here in roughly six weeks or so um, for all the participating nonprofit organizations, in this case private schools, but all of our EIOs and pre-K groups and, and everyone um, begins in later this fall, so I have some topics to address about that. That's one of the things Barbara talked about as far as the, the media coverage of the programs and some of the I don't know, criticisms, if you will, of some of the schools and groups that participate to make sure everything is accurate and make sure everybody's reporting accurate information to our staff and to our office so that when we are asked for statistics and dollars and figures that we are able to provide those numbers back accurately um, both to media coverage for sure, but the legislature, the legislature is the, the group that drives this program and drives the funding for this program. So our role is to certainly provide them with success of the program and provide them with the, the historical data that they can prove that the investments that the Commonwealth is making into the programs is truly beneficial 
um, to students and to families and, and is assisting them with their educational um, quality. Um, what I do plan to do is, is keep the presentation somewhat informal, meaning as I'm addressing a topic or a slide and, and you guys would have a particular question, please, at the moment, we can talk about that question. So it um, leads to better discussion and will lead to more interaction. A lot of times will also then lead to um, maybe a topic that I didn't necessarily have addressed in one of, in one of the slides and, and can get us onto that group because more than likely someone else in the room has the same question. Um, being that the, the presentation is being recorded, I will repeat the questions. So um, shout them out to me. I'll repeat it so everyone hears it, both in person and online. And then we'll um, go from there and, and answer the questions the best I can. There will also be a moment at the end for questions. So if someone feels more comfortable waiting and following up at the completion of it, that's fine as well. Okay. Questions before we start? No. All right. Come on, Ron. All right, the so opening slide there as we see the EITC is the acronym for the Educational Improvement Tax Credit Program. Um, over the years, the two programs have been combined to hierarchy legislation would call them the educational tax credits um, for the purposes of internal control and, and our participants. It's still recognized as two separate programs. Um, starting with the EITC program, it's a business tax credit program, whereas um, our agency manages business donors who are applying for the tax credits. They are then making donations to participating nonprofits and participating private schools. In this case, private schools are using the dollars then to cover the cost of tuition for um, families and parents to be able to send their child um, to a private school environment. Um, we also have other types of uh, public school groups and pre-K scholarship groups that we'll address in a minute here as far as um, their role and, and how they participate. The program itself has um, pre-K through 12th grade participation originally started in 01 for K to 12. 2004 saw the introduction of the pre-K scholarship program um, under the EITC umbrella. There's that little history of the program. Um, we're starting now in year 18 of the EITC program. Started in 2001 as a very small $30 million tax credit program. At the time, a lot of groups and schools didn't even know the program existed. It was $30 million. We were leaving money on the table um, every year, meaning we weren't even reaching the caps and the limits weren't even being met. So the groups that knew about the program early on, that was, that was good for them. They were able to successfully um, have no problems getting their business participants involved and getting their business participants approved. And as over time, as they gain their advantages, there's been a preference put into the legislation. As I mentioned, $30 million in 2001, it's grown a lot over the years. Um, and to today's, you know, $185 million in 2019. Um, very rare for a, a state-run program to have bipartisan support on both sides of the aisle, both in the House and in the Senate. Um, started under Governor Ridge, uh, saw increases a couple of times under Governor Rendell, um, more increases under Governor Corbett, and even the current Wolf administration has now increased the EITC program by $60 million over the last three years. So um, again, it's, it's somewhat uncommon to have a program that's supported such widely um, by both political parties, which is, uh, it's good for all of us, to be honest, in the room, um, that you know, we don't have to worry about um, this program potentially going away as administrations change and new leadership takes control um, in the legislature. Types of organizations. Um, most of you in the room, if not all of you in the room, are, are all scholarship organizations, going by the acronym of SO. Um, as we refer to them um, on a daily basis in the office as SO, scholarship organizations. You can see the funding there for scholarship organizations. That's where the $25 million for this year went entirely to the SO fund. Now funded at $135 million annually. SOs provide tuition assistance for students who attend private schools. Um, financially eligible families um, that fit the criteria if there's funding available. These EITC SO dollars are used to, in most cases, offset some of the cost of tuition um, 
you guys would know better than me as far as the percentage of how many get full scholarships in comparison to partial scholarship is my understanding. Um, a lot of these dollars are just used to offset to help families out to be able to cover um, more costs. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, with the new increase of 110 million up to $135 million this year, is the entire balance of funds fully exhausted? And the answer is yes. Um, so last year was 110 fully maxed out. You got the new 25 million for this year. Um, going into July 1, and we have some topics that we'll talk about businesses in a minute, um, there was roughly 24 of that 25 million available. All right, so there are, and it's all gone. And the waiting list, once again, is, you know, $80 million, something to that effect. That's significantly high in dollar amounts. Yes. So the uh, question is the $135 million, is it mostly renewal business applicants taking up those dollars or new business applicants? Um, so of the 135, $111 million was for the renewal business applicants meaning the balance of 24 million would be for all of the brand new applicants, new companies get new entities involved in, to participate. Okay. Second type of organization, um, which some of you are probably familiar with uh, based upon maybe prior workings or just dealing in the nonprofit world, educational improvement organizations. These are what we call EIOs. $37.5 million, they've been level funded for the last three seasons, um, have not seen an increase in quite a while for the EIO dollars. Um, these are nonprofits that are serving public school students through innovative, academic, in most cases, hands-on programming. So a lot of your YMCA's, your museums, your public school foundations, uh, boys and girls clubs, junior achievements, these types of groups are all providing academic programming, um, K-12 students that, again, hands-on, innovative type of stuff. So it's not your standard um, classwork or coursework um, that we're funding and being approved. These are really um, areas that students can, can learn more and, and really retain more of the information than just your standard classroom instruction that, you know, inside the, the confines of the public school walls. Uh, the final group there then is pre-K scholarship groups, $12.5 million. It's the smallest uh, pot of the overall $185 million for EITC. It's exactly the same as scholarship organizations. It provides tuition assistance for families uh, to attend academic-based, tuition-based pre-K programs. Um, so it's not daycare services. This is um, students actually coming in and receiving instructions. There's age limits required around that, and then there's academic um, requirements around that that participating schools must demonstrate to us to show that they are an academic-based um, pre-K and not, not just a, a daycare provider. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so the question is, um, I mentioned earlier, we got $60 million increases over the last three years um, to the EITC funding level. Um, it's all determined by the legislature, so it's not determined by our agency in any way. Uh, the legislature makes those determinations um, where the dollars go. Uh, it's Certainly, if it was based on demand, the EIO funds would, would have gone up over the last couple of years. Um, to be honest, it's, it's the, the groundswell of, of support and the, you know, the, the groups that really have a special interest in this type of program that are able to influence those who make the decisions and are able to educate those who make these decisions on the funding levels. And they, they put the money into that particular category of the ITC. Okay. Quick overview is in regards to uh, business eligibility um, and, and why a business will participate. Basically, any business in the Commonwealth of PA is eligible to apply for the EITC program as long as they have a tax liability. Um, certainly would encourage them to participate. They're not getting anything for free by participating in the program. This is just a means for um, a business uh, person or, or at their business level even that's you know, going to have liabilities with the Commonwealth of PA. And instead of paying their tax liabilities into the PA Department of Revenue to be spent on a, a road project in Erie um, in the general fund, 
this enables the business community to kind of dictate where their tax dollars are going and they can keep their dollars local, impact their schools, impact their community and their families. Um, you have a lot of business leaders that are certain alumni of schools and they, they, this is a means for them to support their, their schools and make sure that their dollars are going directly back into the school and again, not to be spent on, on a project in, in the northern tier of PA. Um, Nothing for free. It's it's certainly they're going to spend the money no matter what. It's just for them to kind of be you know, they're going to spend. Uh, participating organizations receive upwards of a ninety percent tax credit um, if they decide to sign up for two years. We have about thirty four hundred businesses that participate in the EITC and OSTC programs. Ninety five percent of those companies sign up for two years um, in order to get the higher tax credit percentage. So it's it's rare to do a one year commitment, which only nets you a seventy five percent tax credit on your donation amount. Um, there's been some federal law changes in August of last year. Um, CPAs would be much better uh, versed to kind of discuss this, but groups were able to kind of double dip on a federal, on a state tax credit and then a federal deduction. Um, there's been some changes to the tax code, if you will, with the federal government that you're no longer allowed to do that, I believe, but you're still able to use the difference between the dollar amounts of your tax credit and your donation amount. So that remaining 10%, uh, to be used as a charitable gift. So an accountant can certainly have it costing very little out of pocket for a business to, to donate. And most businesses then uh, certainly do a PR uh, push behind their donation and, and like to get out and you know visit the schools and take pictures um, presenting the check and, and make sure that that information is presented to the public. Obviously banks being our most active EITC participants, you guys are very familiar. They, they like to do that a lot and you see the pictures in the newspaper and online all the time presenting EITC donations. So um, certainly that's, and that's fine. There just can't be any, um, and this just goes for any nonprofit giving gift, I believe. There can't be a, a monetary value to any type of award or, or presentation that you would give to a, a tax credit donor. So a golf outing, for instance, you wouldn't be able to provide a free golf outing tickets if they donate $10,000, but you know, putting their picture out there, putting their name on a, on a little banner certainly does not have monetary value. A uh, final bullet there talks about pre-K. The pre-K program for the first $10,000 is a full 100% tax credit. Um, we do have several companies that like to participate just up to $10,000 in their pre-K to get the 100%. Each dollar amount on top of the 100 um, comes in at a 90% tax credit for a max under pre-K of $200,000 um, per entity and max under K to 12 EITC is $750,000. We do have several companies, uh, back to banks, large investment firms, insurance firms that do do the max tax credit um, annually. You have some that there is no minimum. You have a, a small corner, uh, I don't know, machine shop that has three employees that maybe does you know $800 a year. So there is no minimum, but the maximum is $750,000 per business. Per year, correct. Yeah, so a company signs up, as I mentioned, two-year cycles to get the higher tax credit percentage um, and signs up for the two years and donates to get the $750,000 tax credit. It's a donation of $833,333 per year. Yes. There's not. So the question is, is their dollar amounts matter? When someone applies, do they get a preference over someone who is maybe only applying for $500? And the answer is no. Um, it's all through a randomization process um, that we do. And we'll, we'll chat in a minute about how we do that, but we certainly do not put any preference on dollar amounts. Okay. Yes. They do. Yes, all of our applicants, the entity, does have to be a uh, certified nonprofit group. And they provide um, documentation to our office that they are a nonprofit. Okay. Can schools be on more than one organization? Yes, absolutely. And most do, to be honest. Most are pre-K, K to 12, EITC, and OSTC. And then it's back on the schools to when donations are being received to make sure those dollars are being properly allocated into the correct pot of funds internally so that you're tracking those dollars to report back to us. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, so the question is, um, since the program has grown rapidly, has, has our staff increased, basically? Um, so we've increased from the time that I started, to be honest. Um, you know, it was, um, I started as an analyst. It was myself and another analyst and a director. Um, we're now to myself and four analysts, uh, clerical staff. So it's a total of seven staff. Um, we could probably have, you know, double that or even more, um, you know, more with less, as they say. So there hasn't been, you know, we, right. Yeah, everybody knows that in today's world. So um, we haven't necessarily had that discussions recently, um, but yeah, so it has, it has been increased staffing, yes. Um, we'll talk briefly about one of the things that changed in the program that is gonna assist everybody, including our staff, but all of our participants, every um, entity that, that is involved in EITC, um, one most important change that's happened since the beginning. Okay, yes, in the back. So sit tight, the question is about individuals. Sit tight on that question. The next slide will address that um, specifically. The answer is kind of yes to your end, but we'll, we'll go over in a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so charters, you said charter school? Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I would say if you if you are designated as a, a private school and designated as a non-chartered school, non-profit private school, um, certainly you'd be eligible. Um, I'm familiar, it's Scranton School for the Deaf used to exist or? Okay. Okay. And Scranton, I think, rings a bell that they used to be a participant. They, okay. They're no longer in existence. Okay, got it. And I think they were a participant in years past, which would lead me to believe the answer to your question would be yes. Okay. okay. Any other questions for this? Okay, moving on. Your question as far as individuals, okay. New to the program, uh, 2014, I believe, um, saw the introduction of what we call special purpose entities, SPEs. Um, it was the very first time that anybody has ever heard the term SPE. It was created in the legislature for the sole purpose of tax credits, all right? Um, they're basically fictitious businesses, okay? The businesses only exist on paper. You file with the Department of Revenue, you file with the Department of State as a legal business entity, but there is no bricks and mortar operations. There's no manufacturing, it's, there's nothing. Um, it's just on paper that this entity exists and, and does file tax returns and is in legal existence with the Commonwealth of PA. At this point, you have a particular leader, leaders of this special purpose entity. A lot of times it's the schools have formed their own special purpose entities. And you go out and you solicit investors to invest money into this special purpose entity and become a member of your special purpose entity. And that entity then applies to our office as a business. We look at them, they have an EIN, they have tax ID numbers, they are an actual business. They file with our office to get involved with, with the EITC and or OSTC programs. Um, if approved for EITC participation, then all of these investors are now paying money into the SPE. The SPE is cutting a check from the business, if you will, and they're cutting a check directly to a school or schools that are participating EITC organizations. The organization is spending those monies just like they do if the check's coming from PNC Bank. It's an actual tax credit donation from a business. You're issuing a receipt letter back to that donor. The donor's reporting back to us that they've properly made that donation. And at the back end, then, the tax credits are getting applied out to each individual member of the SPE based upon their percentage of ownership in the SPE entity. If it's two individuals each at 50%, that's easy. It's just a split tax credit that each member can, can pick up. But in most cases, there can be 30, 40, 50 members for varying dollar amounts. Um, you do have to know each, who each of the members are, obviously, because the tax credit is gonna be split out based upon their investment amount, their percentage of ownership of that SPE entity.
It's the same cycle, same cycle as businesses. Correct. Yeah, so the question is, how does the tax credit get applied to that investor? Um, it's the same exact thing as where um, the tax credits get posted at the SPE entity level and then file through um, what we call the title, the REV 1123 form. It's a Department of Revenue form. It's not our agency. And through that form, you identify who the members of the SPE are. You file it with the tax return. And then the Department of Revenue is able to recognize who those members are and pass the tax credits through to each of those members or those shareholders. All right, one thing worth noting that's very important in the SPE world and Department of Revenue, again, not us, Department of Revenue, people have horror stories sometimes with dealing with Department of Revenue, but just understand that they are required through the legislation to do tax compliance checks, both at the entity business level for all participants and all individual members of an SPE. So what that means is, a lot of times there's 40 members in an SPE that are all signing up to participate in this. In most cases, you don't know who the other members are. You know, John Smith and, and Jane Doe are each members in an SPE, but they have no idea that they both do this and they don't know what dollar amount. You're putting a lot of um, trust, if you will, that every member of your SPE is in good standing with the Department of Revenue and has no red flags on their account for outstanding liabilities or not filing proper documents in years past Whereas when Department of Revenue is looking to apply these tax credits, these are uh, restricted tax credits, so they are posting them individually to account if there's a red flag, that not only affects that one particular individual, it affects the entire group of the SPE. So there are risks associated with it. Um, you know, you would ask someone that they're good and, and you know, most people aren't going to tell you if they have problems with the Department of Revenue for varying reasons and, and some might not even know that they have issues with the Department of Revenue. Um, but if there are issues with an entity, or with an individual, sorry, it could create problems for everybody. So just keep that in mind as, as you guys are coming up more thought processes about SPEs. I can tell you that they are very popular, no doubt about it. That's where the demand for the dollars has skyrocketed over the last couple of years. It's because these, the involvement of SPEs has skyrocketed over the last couple of years. When it started in 2014, there was only a handful of groups that even could wrap their mind around what an SPE is. Since that time, those same groups have become really well versed in understanding SPEs and are assisting other groups in knowledge of SPEs. Um, and that's where the demand for tax credits has gone so high. Even our wait list, when I throw out the numbers of, you know, 80 million, $100 million in wait list demand, a lot of that is special purpose entities. It's a, it's a mechanism for individuals to get involved in the program. It was always a business tax credit program. Other states, there's about 18 other states that have tax credit programs. Um, Florida, for instance, allows just a regular person, you know, off the street to cut a check to a school and get tax credits based upon that donation amount. Pennsylvania does not allow it directly like that, but this is a means to get individuals involved in the program. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can anyone be a member of an SPE? Um, definitely more based towards an accountant, for sure. But I will try my best to have an understanding of talking with them over the years. But um, it, the way the, the legislation would read, it would be an employee or business owner of another business firm. So any employee of a business can certainly participate. Um, the question that's come up a lot since this all started is retired individuals or employees that maybe work for a nonprofit, can they participate? Um, and my understanding in, in talking with both Department of Revenue and accountants, if that individual has investments of some kind that they're able to show that they are um, have investments in the stock market and own percentages of whatever stocks, that makes them eligible. Okay, but again, if you're hearing or you're working directly with an accountant, that's um, I would trust that he or she has you know their professional understanding of, of these sorts of things and, and would certainly guide you in the right direction on that. Question over here somewhere. Yes.
Sure. So the question is, if a business unfortunately doesn't get approved at the business level and they are on a wait list, can they jump in and become a member of an SPE? Uh, businesses can be members of the SPE um, trust and or the owner of that particular group can withdraw or leave his or her application and become a member of the SPE. Yes. Um, I know a lot of businesses, I guess okay, maybe it's split. A lot of businesses think that if they become the member of the SPE, they're just given one check and they're done with it and they don't really have to follow up with paperwork and all that sort of stuff and they like to do it that way. Then on the other side of the coin is a business owner who likes to be cutting a check directly from his or her corporation directly to the school to show that they're impacting. You know, the school might not even know who that SPE member is that gave them the $10,000, but if it's coming from ABC Corporation, then they can see that it's coming directly from the business. So it's it's still split whether or not someone would want to do an SPE instead of doing it through their business. Um, but the answer to your question is yes, they can certainly become a member of an SPE. Um, and we can talk about the wait list in a minute. Um, it's not the end of the world if someone ends up on the wait list. I think it's all covered. Yeah, I mean, we don't ever see the agreements that filed um, in regards to their legal agreements or their documents with legal counsel and filing with the Department of State and Department of Revenue. We don't have access to any of that. And to be honest, when an applicant applies, unless it's identified by name that it's a special purpose entity, that's really only the way we can pick it up. Um, we see companies come through all the time, and if it's just a, I don't know, if it's not a unique name per se, and it's something, you know, 1527 LLC. We don't know if that's a if that's a business, and that may be you know a, a real estate holding company of some sort, or if it's an SPE. Department of Revenue certainly knows that answer, but we don't. We look at it as a business. They have an EIN. They have a point of contact with as a listed as a president or a CEO or a managing member, and and we uh, review and approve. Just treat it as if it's regular business. Okay. Question over here. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the question is, are we able to track how much approvals every year is SPE and how much is, is an actual bricks and mortar business? Um, it's very difficult to do so because if we ran reports, we could pull out a high percentage of what the SPEs are, but more than likely we're going to miss some because it just looks as if it's a normal business to us. You know, I mean, you recognize Wawa and you can easily, but you don't recognize these other ones that you're not really sure and it can easily be missed. Um, the SPEs that have gotten in and you're, and you're driving more people through the SPEs, maybe that already ex are existing SPEs, um, they, they can take advantage of this, you know, the early window, which we'll talk about in a minute as far as applications. So that behooves them because they're able to increase their dollar amounts where maybe three years ago they were only doing 100,000 and but now they're up to 500, 800,000 and they're referenced into the approval cycle. Okay. So. so when you say qualified investor, you mean that they're able to have a particular amount that they're able to give? I think that's established by each SPE. So that's not a criteria established by the Commonwealth. I think each SPE establishes the criteria of their investment amount and do they have the ability to, I think for what my understanding is the reason they do that is these operate on two year cycles and that SPE doesn't wanna to have to worry about this particular investor that second year not being able to come up with the money to be able to fund the SPE. So they, they put a minimum amount in there knowing that these investors have the, the wealth that they can rely on for that second year donation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think when they're soliciting their members and their uh, participants in the SPE, just like a business, when a business is looking at their bottom line, what their tax liabilities are gonna be for the year, and that's how they gauge what they wanna apply for. It's the same with an SPE member. 
um, he or she knows what their liabilities are going to be for that year and then pledges the dollar amount to offset as close as they can to that liability dollar, final dollar amount. So you can have high wealth individuals that may need, you know, $50,000 and they donate X amount, but you may have a, a you know, Y individual that does only needs a couple thousand and only contributes $4,000 in the BSP. It does not have to be the same dollar amount for everybody in the SP. It can, it would probably make it more easy if everybody was just a straight $10,000, but they vary all over. Correct. Yep. Yeah. How much they gave in is how it's calculated for the distribution of the credit. Um, I, I have not heard any of that, to be honest. Um, I think SPEs have become so popular to try to get away from it at this point. It was, it's really, would be difficult. Um, just understanding of the legislation over the years, it's um, very difficult to get something out of the law once it's in there. You know, it's, you know, you fight, fight to get something in, which is the SPEs, and now it's in. To try to get it out is, is very challenging. I have not heard um, a push to get away from it, to be honest. But again, that's not the decision that we make, the minister, but we wouldn't make that decision. Okay. Yes. Right. That's a decision made at the, the SPE level. Yeah, so we do not get involved in any of that. If I can tell you that most, a lot of SPEs are already connected with particular schools and donate those dollars. Um, if there's an arrangement or an agreement with the SPE and the business donor or the individual that I want this X amount of dollars to go to this school, that's an agreement between the donor, the member, if you will, and the, and the, the uh, SPE, okay? How do you find an SPE that already exists as a bit, or how do you find an investor in an SPE? SPEs, um, a lot of them already exist for sure. Um, a lot of them already exist in the Southeast for sure. There's a lot that are um, available. Um, as far as finding them, that could certainly be a challenge. I would agree. Um, you know, we have lists of participating business entities, but you may come across the same challenge that we have. We look at the list. And one, you might not know someone's an SPE entity, and two, that SPE may be full. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could certainly share the list of participants, and if you wanted to kind of look at the list and go from there. Now, that SPE might say to you, well, we only do our school, and unfortunately, you know, we're not looking to branch out to other schools. And that, that may be the case, um, or you could potentially, you know, look into starting one for your school. Um, no, no, it's all, it's all looked at as a business and it's, you know, it, we've had businesses over the years who've given 500,000 to the same school every year and we've never looked differently on that business. So we look at that SPE the same way. If they're supporting their school and their school only, they receive the tax credits and support their schools. Okay. Sorry, the question is, do we look uh, differently at an SPE that maybe spends their dollar directly in one school? or an SPE that spreads the dollars around to multiple schools um, throughout an area. Mm -hmm. To be increased? Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, I'm not familiar with those discussions, to be honest. Uh, that's all established again through the legislation. Um, we don't establish the income criteria. We, um, it's, it's annually in the school code. This is the max scholar or max household income per family. And then there's an additional allowance um, per dependent in the household. Um, but, you know, like you said, if they're $5 over, unfortunately, that, that family is not eligible. Um, whereas if they're just a dollar under, they can be eligible for the full amount. I'm not familiar with discussions of of tweaking those okay a lot of people and that's one of the things that have been talked about um in the media coverage if you will a lot of people would say that those household limits are um pretty high as it is 
you know, if you have a family of four or five, that those dollars can go pretty high and, and for eligibility. Um, so I don't know if they would risk putting a phase in of even going higher, you know, that, that would even potentially create more enough negativity or just more discussion and more, more spotlight on these families that truly need the dollars. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna read some of the questions that have come in. How much of the 135 allocated to SOs do SPEs account for? We, we chatted about that. Unfortunately, that's not a question that we can 100% accurately know because SPEs are somewhat, not that they're purposely hiding, but they're hidden under the LLC name that we don't know that you're an SPE unless it's 100% demonstrated. How many of the tax credits are distributed to SPEs versus other businesses? Um, basically the same answer. Can't answer that 100% accuracy. Um, and do individual members of an SP have a minimum or max contribution amount that is up to each SPE to determine? That's again up to the SPE if they want to have a, a max. The reason they do it, and this is your question, is, is they like to know that that particular donor is going to be involved next year and they don't have to run the risk of losing someone. And then they're, because you have to give the same dollar amount that you did in year one and year two to maintain your tax credit percentages and maintain your preference moving forward. So if they lose a member, now they're scrambling trying to replace that member and, and that's a predicament that someone does not want to be in for year two, okay? SBEs have, have created a lot of discussion on the program. Um, so it's, it's not surprising that, that a lot of our questions thus far have been on SBEs. Application process for businesses. Um, obviously we're past this now being that we're into the fall, but this is the cycle that businesses participate on. Um, reoccurring applicants, meaning applicants who have previously participated in the program in the most recently part, uh, previous fiscal year, they open up beginning on May 15th and it runs through June 30th. Our recommendation is, although it's a 45 day window for all of our returning applicants, um, both for EITC and OSTC to apply as close to May 15th as possible. Um, don't wait till June 30 to get your application in. Yes, so we'll get, we will certainly, next up, that's going to be big news, actually. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, the recurring applicants are there. Um, the initial applicants, meaning a company who's applying for EITC or OSTC participation for the very first time, a company who maybe, unfortunately, missed a year or two and now wants to get back into the program, or a company who only applies annually for 75% tax credit under a one-year commitment, they apply on July 1st of every year. It's very important. And it doesn't even guarantee of anything that if you are trying to get into the program and your first time to apply on July 1st, if you miss that by one day, unfortunately, the odds of getting approved with the July 2nd application are, are slim and none, to be honest. It's not going to happen. You're going to be on a waiting list buried by upwards of 80 to $100 million with very, very limited odds of ever getting that application approved. Um, the application itself is very easy to complete. A lot of you have probably seen the online application that's submitted through our uh, electronic single application system uh, portal. It's the hardest part. It's going to set up a username and password. That's going to take you the most time, five minutes at most. Um, make sure, like with everything else, that you remember what the username and password is moving forward for future applications. Um, but you, once you have that populated, there's a button on the screen that you can copy all of your profile information meaning name, address, phone number, business name, with one click, the, the application itself is now populated, so you don't have to do it again. And then we have the addenda of the application where you must identify the amount of your donation. So we do need to know how much you're looking to donate or how much a business is looking to donate through the program. Um, and this is very, very important in regards to the type of tax credit. So it's one addenda for all EITC, meaning all three categories of EITC, it's one addenda. Make sure that particular applicant in this case is selecting SO for scholarship organizations or PKSO for pre-K. Um, if someone selects EIO, that is not what most of you in the room are interested in, in gaining support for the EIOs, so um, they do not want to select EIO. If that would be done, it'd be done in error. We, um, at our analyst level, have the track record of participating businesses every year okay so if it's a business that has been in for the last five years and we can see that they've given the scholarship groups every year and now this year they've applied under EIO um, we have the ability to recognize that as probably being an error and we flag that application and we can reach out to that particular applicant and, and explain you know are you sure you want to do this and you, we believe it may be a mistake a lot of times it is a mistake and we were able to amend that over to make sure they're in the proper category 
Um, but for new companies who don't have any track record in the program, we don't have the ability to know that it may have been done in error. Um, we look at it as if they're trying to do an EIO gift. Um, they, you don't tell us on the application who you're looking to donate to. It's just a category of type of donation. So we will process that application as being EIO. And unfortunately, that business may be you know, left behind on a waiting list for EIO tax credits when all along they wanted to donate to a private school. So just make sure when you're educating your business donors that they know when they are on the addenda of the application that they are selecting the right type of donation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Yeah. So in years past, for many, many years, um, and companies would take, the, take it to their advantage. The question is, can they switch between scholarship organizations and educational improvement organizations from year to year? Um, and some were even advised to do it as a strategy by their you know, accountant or by their development officer at an EIO. They would apply for year one under scholarship and make donations through private schools. And because the EIO dollars were exhausted so quickly every year, then in year two, they would switch over and then get into EIO and stay in EIO. It was a means for them to get their foot in the door as a tax credit participant. Um, the legislation changed um, last year, but implemented for this year, where it no longer allows companies to do that. So someone got, you know, wind that that was a strategy people were using and, and you know, wasn't necessarily pleased that that was a strategy and, and got, you know, whoever in the legislature to write language in the law that prohibits companies from switching back and forth from EIO to SO from year to year. All right. You can do both. So a company can certainly have two applications in one year approved, one under EIO and one under SO and keep every year donating to both types. But they're recognized as separate applications and are applying separately every year for each type of donation. OK. Um, the, the Preference process as far as that May 15th returning applications, make sure that when you have your donors that are participant, active participants in the EITC program, that they remain active participants in the EITC program and they apply um, annually on time. It's very, very important to make sure that they understand these timelines um, for applications. Uh, as I mentioned, if you miss it by a day, you're out of luck and going to be um, buried on a wait list. The approval timeline and next steps. So the approval timeline for those in the room that, you know, live through the budget impasse two out of the last five years are very aware that um, it's very heavily impacted by the budget negotiations every year. Okay. So until we have a budget agreement, tax credit approvals have been withheld um, 2014, I believe it was, till Christmas Eve. I mean, we were not issuing any approvals when literally until December 24th and then pushed out 3,000 or so letters on Christmas Eve. And then it happened again in 2017, I believe, where the approvals were held until end of October-ish, range, maybe in November. So it's, it's very political, if you will, this program. And it's a means for, you know, budget negotiations, we'll call them, um, as far as tax credit awards. So always just understand that uh, it's, it's heavily relied on, on the budget agreement. The uh, red underlined bold, all that sort of stuff goes back to Cynthia's question. It, it revolves around fiscal year 1920, which is the current year. All uh, business approvals, meaning both renewal applications and initial applicants for businesses, are all out the door. Meaning everybody who's eligible for tax credit approval, their letter should be certainly in hand or somewhere in transit. That wrapped up on Friday, which is this past Friday, the 13th. So maybe there are still some in transit, still heading somewhere, but most businesses who have been approved for tax credits um, have received their don their letters authorizing them to move forward. Um, it's very important, and I don't know if you want to give it, you know, some time to kind of before you start banging on doors and making sure that these businesses understand the importance of that letter. But just reach out at some point so they understand the letter that they got doesn't get lost somewhere. Especially the new companies, um, the the people who have done it in the past have an understanding of, oh yeah, it's the CITC. I, I, I remember the steps. I got to cut a check and report back all that. But the new companies might not understand the importance and the timelines of making their donations. So make sure you educate them that they have 60 days from the date on their approval letter. It started at the end of August. So some companies are almost 30 days into their approval for their um, year two of two applications. So their window is certainly ticking and not necessarily near closed yet, but it, it quickly will. 
So um, make sure you're educating them on that. A lot of you have probably maybe already received gifts, hopefully. Um, so everybody's happy with that. And that was a main priority um, of the administration for this year. And certainly our executive offices um, was to make sure we were under strict, basically orders, if you will, to these approvals need to be out by mid-September um, for this year to, in order for schools to be able to have these dollars early and make sure that they're um, able to spend their dollars early in the school year. Um, just educate them on the process then as well, as far as reporting back to us. That will also assist us then in, in moving the wait list. So the waiting list every year, when, when basically when approvals get delayed, it, it pushes everything back. And trying to get an understanding of that is if you're approved in August, October, November, and you're not making your donation to the end of the calendar year and you have to report back to us in the new year, we're then not recapturing wait list tax credit approvals until you know, late winter or into the spring. This now being out the door earlier enables us to kind of track potential defaults or potential withdrawals of application in and around, you know, November, December range. And we'll be recapturing tax credits and pushing tax credit approvals from the wait list back out the door. So the approval timeline being stepped up certainly benefits um, everyone for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is in regards to the EITC waitlist. Um, if it, you are not uh, denied, if you're on a waitlist, you're on the waitlist, you're in a pending status, we can tell someone specifically where they are on the waitlist. We can give them, you know, sometimes unfortunate news as far as whether or not their look odds are good um, or if they're going to be out of luck. The waiting list moves annually some, somewhere about $1.2 to $1.5 million. So if someone's in that range, we can say, hey, it might happen. You know, you're on the wait list, but it's not the end of the world. You may receive a call from us uh, six weeks or three months from now offering tax credits. And at that point, they can decide to move forward or decline the wait list approval. Um, if someone's, you know, $10 million down on the wait list, that's unfortunately if they tell them that and they end up on a, in a pending status till the end of the year. And then they reapply next year and could end up on a wait list all over again. Um, where's notification of the waiting list? Um, Back when the program was only 45 or $60 million, we were able to issue all of our approvals and then issue waitlist letters. Um, the program has grown now to, you know, 3,800 business approvals going out and another 1,200 businesses that are on the waitlist. So the, the option of getting waitlist letters out, it just became not feasible anymore, unfortunately. Um, what we tell people is if they're not authorized with an approval letter, operate under a strong assumption that it's on the waiting list, okay? Um, there are applicants in this current cycle of approval that a couple of options, they may have not gotten their letter yet because they're not due to donate again until January of 2020. So if you're expecting a donation from a company and you're not sure if they got their letter and you reach out and they tell you they haven't received their approval letter, certainly at, or look even at your records and figure out when they made their last donation because their next donation is likely going to be in that same season. So if they donated in January or February of 19, most businesses operate on calendar tax years. When they've applied again for this year, they are more than likely approved, but they won't receive their approval letter until January of 2020. Okay, so understand that. Always track their historical record of when they donate. Um, there's um, also the whole non-compliant issue that goes on with the Department of Revenue. I talked about that with SPEs and these individual donors. Businesses have the same um, compliance check as well. So the Department of Revenue is doing a compliance on the business entity. If they have been flagged for owing liabilities or missing documents with the PA Department of Revenue, the Department of Revenue has flagged them, and we are not authorized to approve an applicant if they have outstanding liabilities with the Department of Revenue. 100% makes sense. They shouldn't be able to take advantage of a tax credit if they have liabilities somewhere else with the Department of Revenue. Revenue has reached out to those applicants. It's not that many. It's only a couple hundred, less than, right around 200. Um, they have reached out and notified those applicants via uh, letters authorizing them that they have been flagged as non-compliant. It gives them contact information on where they need to go to resolve their matters so that they, they can then, so we have their tax credits currently reserved. We have not moved on from that applicant, meaning if they get things cleaned up, they're going to be out of luck. We have their credits reserved, but it's time sensitive. So um, if someone has gotten a letter from the Department of Revenue, they want to move on it. And when I say time sensitive, in and around the beginning of October, Department of Revenue is set to provide us with a second update on those companies who have resolved their issues. Hopefully it's, I don't know, all of them, I doubt it, but hopefully it is. And at that point, then we'd get those uh, 200 approved. Um, but if it's only 100, we'll get the 100 approved. 
there'll be one final reach out at that point to those remaining hundred that are non-compliant saying, Hey, you got to do this now or else, you know, you're going to be out of luck. And by October 15th, if they don't resolve their issues, those credits, which they have been, you know, reserved for that company will be moved elsewhere. And that company, unfortunately, will now be out of EITC and have to reapply in future years as an initial applicant. And as we talked about, it can be a challenge to get back into the program. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing right now is just make sure that your donors that got their approvals are moving on donations. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's funny, we got, the, we got, a, I had to have a conversation with a gentleman just Monday or Tuesday of this week, and, you know, everybody's happy, most people are happy, but this guy, he, he called and, and said, you know, I'm used to making my donation around the end of the tax year. And now you're telling me I have to make it within 60 days. And now I, I don't know. And so he's, he was like the other side of it. Right. So. Friday, correct. You're on a wait list, right? And you can certainly reach out to me and I can kind of give you a yay or a nay as far as the odds of, of getting it approved. Okay. Yes. They are not. So the question is the approval process and how are the determinations made um, in regards to that? So yeah, so it's our agency and the way it's done. So this year we've, we've talked about how of the new 25, we had $24 million available. We had roughly application demand of $100 million. So our staff is responsible for reviewing all these applications, getting them prepped into a pending status as we call it. And then we, Excel has a tool. So all of these applications are entered into an Excel spreadsheet by business name, dollar amount, and Excel has a randomizer tool. And with a couple of keystrokes, the list that's published is now randomized amongst themselves, okay? Um, again, not by dollar amount, not by location, geography-wise, or anything. Yeah. No, yeah, no, it's all. Absolutely. And then we basically, if we have 24 million available, we start at the top of the list and we, we scroll down until we reach the 24 million. That's our cutoff point. Everybody above the cutoff gets approved. Below the line is on a waiting list. And that waiting list stays in that exact same order that it was published in for the very first time. It does not get edited again. And then once we, if we recapture 100,000 and the, and the company that's at the top of the wait list is requesting 50,000, we offer the, the approval to them. They, in most cases, accept the approval. And then we move on to the next person on the waiting list. So it's all by literally a random luck of the draw, if you will. Yeah, that's yeah, a, a luck. I mean, if you look at it, the, the breakdown of participants, obviously a lot of it's based in the Southeast, but that's just because there's more businesses and there's more money and more schools and more demand in the Southeast and you know, across the Northern tier. So geography, geographically, if you looked at it, you would see a lot of it based in the Southeast, but that's just because of the, you know, the demographics of, of Pennsylvania. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, <laughs> right. No, not at all. So the, the question is, as far as how important it is to get your application submitted, it's, it's by time. There is it time sensitive, really, I guess, is the question. Um, it's first come, first served by date received, okay? So applications July 1 is very, very important, but it's not necessary to stay up past midnight and submit it at 12.05 because um, that's treated the exact same as an application that comes in at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So it has to be on July 1. That's overarching importance of that. Again, don't do it July 2nd, but it's not time sensitive. Um, it's, it's any application received on July 1 is entered into that Excel spreadsheet that I mentioned and randomized amongst themselves. July 2nd is not included on that. So we, you know, if, if we were to tack applications at the back end, that's where July 2nd would come into the waiting list. But the waiting list is so long just from July 1, we'll never get, never get to a July 2nd app. Okay. All right, some of the other questions here, any discussion of raising the max? We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Early window for SPEs, it's the same exact um, for returning applicants. It's, it's all the same. An SPE is a business entity, so they are eligible to apply in the early window. Uh, next question we'll talk about in a minute.
This one says, if a business currently participating wants to support an SO they haven't previously supported, when do they indicate their desire to make a contribution by May 15th or beginning July 1? So a business, if they want to switch to the school that they're supporting, and, and they're certainly welcome to do so, it's not indicated to us on the application. You select on the application that you want to select an SO. It could be a business that's been doing $100,000 for the last six years, and they've always given it to one group. If they now decide this year they want to give you know, 50 and 50, that's fine. Or if they want to do 80,000 and give this other school 20,000, that's fine as well. You do not need to give to the same school every year. You need to give the same dollar amount in your second year, and you need to give to the same type of organization that you've been approved to donate to. It does not have to be the same recipient school every year. Make sure as a business community that when they understand they got approved for SO dollars, that they understand that they cannot donate to um, the Franklin Institute. Franklin Institute is an EIO um, that we're really, we've updated our letters over the years to be more clear on what type of category someone's been approved for. We've always had the list published and we, we try to make it as clear as possible, but there always every year is a scenario where someone's been approved to donate. And in some cases, large dollar amounts have been approved to donate to a private school through scholarships and end up donating to an EIO. Um, that's very unfortunate when that happens. There's because the credit that we don't have credits laying around to be able to provide for that gift. Um, a lot of times that particular donor is going to be um, out of luck and not going to get tax credits based upon their donation. Um, so make sure that when your donors, if it's a new donor or if they're hesitant and you even need to look at their letter, the letter clearly identifies what they've been approved for, both in the body of the letter. And we've started um, several years ago now adding an app ID to the letter that indicates right after that what type of classification of EITC they've been approved for. So make sure your donors are, are aware of that before, you know, they get to down the road and they have a problem. Uh, everyone approved should have received their acceptance letter. They'd have 60 days to make their gift from the date of the letter. Uh, but some may have received their letter but can't give until January. So they'd have not received their letter. All right. So companies who have been approved but are on a January approval cycle are in our system as approved. We have their credits accounted for, but they have not received their approval letter as of yet. We hold those approval letters until January of the following tax year. Okay. So the ones who've been approved and have their letter are the ones who are due to donate effective immediately. Anyone who's not gotten a letter, they'll get it in January, but we, in status right now, if you looked in our system, would show as approved, but their um, letter is withheld until their new tax year begins in January. How would the business know that? Um, so it's... it's, it's Assumption, and I, when I say that, it's an assumption because they've gotten approval in January or February of this current year. So just looking at their track record every year, they should, and if they would reach out to the school, that's where you guys could come in to assist them and say, oh, you guys, you've made your donation in February of 2019, meaning your tax year. You're not, because that's to be donations in two consecutive tax years. Thus, we hold it until January. So you can assist them in that process as well they could look back at their letter and say, oh, I got it last year in January, February, meaning this year's right. So it's a, I guess it's an assumption, but it's, a, it's an educated, educated assumption based upon a historical track record of when they get their approval every year from our offices. If they're doubtful and they're not really sure what's going on, they can always call. Yeah, 100%. And we can easily pull that up and assist them in, in giving a very quick answer to that. Okay. Another question I thought. No. Is there a way that individuals can suspend their employer withholdings for PA so they don't have to double pay their PA tax expenses twice and wait for the refund? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, I don't think that I've, this is brand new to me. It's can an employee suspend their withholdings for PA so they don't have to double pay their PA taxes twice and wait for the refund? I'm going to say no to that. That seems like a very Department of Revenue based question. It basically, I think what it means is can they withhold the and then because they're going to donate money, they're going to pay the taxes into PA, and then they're going to get a refund at the back end. I think the question is, can they suspend their withholding tax so that they're not paying and then getting it back? I think that's, if I'm on the right path to that question, I'm going to say no to that. Um, Department of Revenue would not allow that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions as far as the business current situation going on with approval? All right. Moving on then to the OSTC program, um, very similar to EITC, um, as everyone in the room is likely aware. It provides scholarships for students, eligible families, and students to attend private schools. The only difference between OSTC and EITC 
is that these students and these families who are OSTC eligible um, must reside within the attendance boundary of a low achieving public school building. Okay, it's not by school district, it's by building. Uh, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 school buildings that have been identified by the Pennsylvania Department of Education as being low achieving. Uh, the low achieving list is generated via uh, standardized tests. So, um, and it's very unfortunate that of the 400, over half of those schools identified by PDE as being low achieving are the school district of Philadelphia. So um, as we sit today, the OSTC is, is primarily based in the Southeast. Um, there is participation obviously in the Southwest as well and up through Central PA and, and a couple of schools in the Northeast and the Lehigh Valley. But OSTC is primarily based in the Southeast um, regarding family and, and uh, student eligibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so there's a, a when the program first started, there, what we, there was not this grandfather clause, as we call it. Um, and it quickly realized, the legislature quickly realized that this is a problem. You know, you have students that maybe have transferred out of public school and into a private school for one year, and now they're not going to be eligible, and there's no way that we can ever afford to, you know, keep sending our students to private school, and now they're back in the public school. So what the, the law changed and the legislation changed, it, it allowed for um, your exact example. If a student got an OSTC scholarship in year one, because the school was on the list, and in year two, that public school building is no longer on the list, which is good, and I always tell people all the time, you don't want to be on the low achieving list. It's not a good list to be on, um, but now you're off the list, all right? That student, he or she, remains eligible if he or she received a scholarship in the prior year. So that's the big main caveat there is they had to have had received a scholarship in the prior year to remain eligible for a period of five years or up until graduation. If this particular student did not get a scholarship in the prior year, they would have been eligible, but they didn't get it. Um, and then year two comes around and that school is no longer on the list. Unfortunately, that student is not eligible because they did not receive a previous award through OSTC. Okay. It depends, it depends on the, the classification of the school. So if that school, if they're going from K to eight or K to six, now they're progressing to high school and the high school has never been part of the low achieving list, it does not follow because that high school is not low achieving, right? In most scenarios, um, if you look at the, you know, 400 schools, and this comes from PDE talking about when they put the list up every year, the ones that are right on the limit are the ones that maybe flip on and off from year to year. The ones that would be buried at the bottom for low achieving test scores, um, very unlikely that they're ever gonna get off that list and more than likely, more than one school building is on the list as well. Okay. Yes, sir. So the question is for OSTC eligibility, if the student is a high school student, are you looking at the grade school that they just graduated out of or the high school that they would be progressing on to? And the answer is the high school. So it's at that time of scholarship award, where that particular student would be attending if he or she were to be enrolled in a public school. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. They would lose. They would lose their grandfather for those final two years and or type of thing, but so yeah, they would lose it after that five years, okay. All right, next for OSTC, a little history of the program like we provided. Um, it started in 2012. This was a Governor Corbett um, introduced program. Started at $50 million. Um, here we are now uh, nine years, I'm sorry, seven years later. Um, for 1920, the program has been increased for the very first time from 50 million to $55 million. Um, very unique to EITC, and in this case, OSTC. The, the additional $5 million has been created specifically as a carve out, all right? Um, so we're still kind of wrapping our processes around how we're gonna implement this and, and how to introduce the additional $5 million. It's allocated specifically for economically disadvantaged schools, okay? And the definition of economically disadvantaged schools 
is that 75% of the students attending the school received OSTC support in the prior school year, all right? So this $5 million is specifically for economically disadvantaged schools, and there's a, a definition of what classifies as an economically disadvantaged school. Um, the problem with the legislation or the, the hurdle that we're in at the moment with the legislation is it only authorizes one organization, one school, one nonprofit to be the sole recipient of these dollars to distribute the funds to the students, okay? We now, for EITC, we have 280, or OSTC, it's about 180 opportunity scholarship organizations. So all of you guys in the room all participate and get your own money and raise the money. The additional $5 million, which is a carve out, we, meaning the department, can only approve one group to be the recipient of those dollars and to raise the funds and distribute those dollars to the students, okay? Um, the legislation was crafted, uh, I would imagine that specifically for one group in mind, all right? It didn't specifically say who that group is gonna be or who it should be. So it's at the, now it's at the department level to try to figure that out. And, and, but it is in the law and, and we're currently working through some hurdles, but we do plan to have an application process announced potentially for anyone that thinks you may fit this criteria of your students, 75% of the students in the school receiving um, OSTC support in the prior year. Now, all of the other criteria of OSTC remains as far as eligibility of families, um, but this is a new caveat. The uh, scholarship amount for OSTC um, for these economically disadvantaged students has increased. Um, it's always been 8,500 as a max scholarship. It's been increased to 9,500. And then for a student with a disability, it's been increased from 15,000 up to 16,000. Right? So there is no application process announced yet for this additional $5 million, both on the organization level and or the business level. Um, but again, understand that our hurdle at the moment is the law only allows us to approve one group and we're trying to figure out how we're gonna uh, accept applications and identify who that group's gonna be. And we do have some thoughts and some processes that we're gonna metrics put in place to figure out who that group's gonna be. But at the moment, um, there is no guidelines or application announced uh, as of yet. So certainly keep in touch with me if you want um, in regards. We won't just you know release an application on Thursday and tell the application by Friday and it's done. We, we do plan to announce it and have an application period to see what the demand is gonna be for that. Okay. Same as businesses, we'll kind of blow through this as far as eligibility, one year for 75%, two years for 90% for OSTC. It's literally the exact same thing for OSTC as it is for EITC. And also with the SPEs, it's all the exact same. Same timeline for businesses uh, as EITC for OSTC, it's all May 15th through the end of June, July 1 being brand new applicants, 60 days to donate once a business is approved. I don't have a big red bold underlined thing, but the OSTC approval letters are also distributed at this time as well. So all approval letters, EITC and OSTC are all out the door. Same timelines, make sure you pay attention to your donors uh, that they are gonna donate within their 60 days. It's very important, it's all time sensitive. Um, I realize that it can be a hassle sometimes and, and you have to hold the hand of your donors to make sure they don't drop the ball on making their gifts. But um, in the long run, when they're you know cutting a check for X amount of dollars to the school, it's, it pays off. So understand 100% that it can be a challenge um, to keep businesses in line. We have the same problems, if you will. Uh, the competitiveness of EITC and OSTC, something that we talked about as far as the credits being exhausted, particularly under the EIO. We haven't made it to new applicants for EIO in, in several years, meaning an applicant that's trying to get in to donate to a, to a public school foundation or, or a museum is 0% chance of getting approved over the last couple of years. Uh, it's remained level funded at 37 and a half. The OSTC program this year and last year has been exhausted prior to July 1 as well. So we get to about middle of June with OSTC and our waiting list has started for those companies who applied in the early window but applied in late June or are currently on a waiting list for OSTC dollars. We'll likely be able to move them off at some point here relatively quickly. But for the moment, they're on a waiting list. Um, OSTC started in 2012 at 50 million. We only had demand of about 20 and then 30 for the second year. But as time has grown here, we've, we've been maxed out on OSTC. So it's um, fully uh, allocated and fully subscribed. The uh, next one talks about the competitiveness of the program. Increased the ITC by $25 million this year. Again, the breakdown of tax credits where it's jumped from 1819 of 160 up to 185 for the current year. And again, the mention of OSTC being exhausted uh, prior to opening day. 
quick message to you guys, and you, a lot of you probably already do this for sure. Um, our agency and our office, we administer the program, all right? We manage it day to day from the business side and the nonprofit side and the private schools. And we make sure everybody's properly um, within the, the law and the legislation and the requirements of the program. We provide, you know, historical data and statistics back to the lawmakers who make the decisions. But it's not our role to go and advocate or lobby for more money for EITC. We give them the facts and, and they make the decisions. It's your role as a, as a nonprofit world and private school world to make sure that you're talking with your local legislators and making sure you're educating them on the importance of these dollars and what these dollars do for your students and your schools and, and, and basically lobbying at that point. And you're making sure that when they are presented with a, in a budget hearing or a budget negotiation that they understand what EITC does for their constituents and does for their families and their schools. Um, so certainly pay attention to that and, and make sure every chance you get, whether it be inviting them to the school or just running into them at certain events that you're, you know, in their ear and make sure you're talking to them about the importance of the, of the tax credit programs for sure. Um, it's very, pop most of them know at now because it's grown into such popularity, but early on tax credits weren't, you know, aware of what was going on with it. So even so, certainly take that opportunity to do so. Um, Representative Terzai, Speaker of the House. So senior leadership in the House is basically the biggest supporter of the tax credit programs throughout both chambers of the legislature. Um, he had House Bill 800 introduced, which was trying to expand EITC by $100 million just in this most recent cycle. Unfortunately, that didn't work out as far as through the, through the governor's office and through agreements, but they did agree on an increase of the $25 million. So um, always keep Representative Terzai in mind as far as um, very influential senior leadership in the House. So uh, make sure you have that, uh, you know, if you're going to reach out, make sure you have him on your radar. And then talk right there about the elected officials. Um, educate them every chance you can get to, to support the programs. All right, so this is uh, obviously going to be very important for everybody in the room. Um, going back to, we'll try to get through it as quickly as we can. In regards to the, you know, the coverage of inaccurate potential reports and, and reporting back to our agency as far as scholarships awarded and, and all that sort of stuff which we talked about at the beginning. It's your organization renewal application season, if you will, all right? The biggest thing that changed for us in the last, you know, 10 years and was the main reason why we were able to get the approval letters issued by September 15th is because the renewal season for the nonprofits and the private schools has changed, all right? It was historically May 1st of every year and would run throughout the summer and would run into the fall. And then the business cycle would start in the middle of May as well. So we have about, uh, I don't know, 1,400 or so nonprofits that participate in EITC and 4,000 businesses. So the ability for our staff and you know, our group to be able to get through nonprofits and businesses and have applications reviewed in a timely fashion that all of the participants are expecting and require for donations to be made by year end, it's just, it wasn't feasible anymore. Okay, so we pushed for several years to get this date changed from May 1st to November 1st. That's also in the legislation, all right? So it wasn't something that we could just implement as policy for our agency. It had to get changed in the law. Um, successfully, this successfully got changed last year. Um, but unfortunately, when it got changed in the budget last year, it was already July 2nd. So the season for 1819 was already over. So it's implemented for this year. So the 1920 renewal season is the one that got pushed from May 1st to a November 1st period. So we're about six weeks away from getting that started. Um, I, I do plan to also, some of you have probably gotten an email from me or a lot of you back in the late spring or late winter, sorry, late spring, early, or early spring, late winter, talking about this change and, and to, there's not going to be any renewal requirements prior until then. I plan to send another email out talking about bullet point number two, all right? Because we're operating on an 18-month cycle for this year, all right, there are going to be a lot of schools and a lot of groups that operate on a fiscal year end. All right, and not a calendar year end that are going to be required to submit two reports to our office. All right, so June 30 is our most common year end that a lot of nonprofits and schools operate on. With that being the case, we're going to use the Appendix 4, for example, that's the K 12 EITC scholarship report. The Appendix 4, you will submit two copies to our office one will be for year end June 30, 2018, and then the second version will be submitted for year end June 30, 2019. That enables us to not miss a year. We're tracking both years now um, to make sure we're properly 
tracking the dollars for 18 and again for 19. Same goes for, you know, September 30 there. It, you know, they operate in September 30, they will give September 30, 18 and September 30, 19. So our office is properly tracking them. There's a second portion to the appendix four. It's called the performance report. That is gonna be done for the 18, 19 school year. So you will only do one performance report um, as you're part of your renewal cycle, but you will do two fiscal reports, okay? So part one twice, part two will only have to be done one time. This is both EITC, OSTC, pre-K, across the board. You will have to submit, again, for groups that operate on these fiscal years. And if you're in the room and you operate on a calendar year, it doesn't affect you at all. You know, the change, only thing that affects you for the change is that now you're reapplying in November instead of submitting back in May. You still only have one year that's done and that's gonna be the 12-31-2018 year end for calendar year filers, okay? This is only a one-time situation because of this 18-month cycle. This is not gonna be annually. You have to do two reports. This is only this one year because next year when you're doing it in November of 2020, you would then submit for June 30 of 2020, okay? So it's a one-time thing in order to phase in our 18-month year, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is uh, requirements of the audit in the 990 that have to be submitted annually with the renewal document being that it's on November 1st, um, a lot may not even be done yet, you know, so we will accept June 30 of 2018 as the completed document. And then every year, November, we would just get the prior year's audit 990, 630, 18. Next year would be 630, 19. Um, to be able to do it that way. Now the calendar year filers that hopefully is complete by now, so they will file the same 990 and audit for the same year they're reporting. Okay. Yeah. So, so the list of organizations that's published currently on the website is also effective for the full 18 months. So if you would pull that up, it says effective from July 1 of 18 through December 31st of 2019. So that list, as donors are getting their letter today tomorrow, whenever, that list is effective and they're able to make their donations to those groups that are on that list right now in the moment. In January, when you know we're through our new year, we will publish a new list in January of 2020 for the groups that have successfully um, renewed and have successfully um, been back on the list. Okay, in the back. What was that again, sorry? Um, so I'm assuming it's exempt. So the question is, if you don't aren't required to file a 990, uh, what do you file? Is that a religious exemption? If you have documentation of the religious exemption, we can take a look at that. Um, what I can tell you is, a lot of 990 was introduced about five years ago as a requirement. We try our best to make notes in the system that this particular group is not required to file a 990. So we would see that and not even, you know, you know, come back to you to request it if we have record of this group doesn't file, we know that it's not a requirement, so you don't have one. Sure, absolutely, that's fine, absolutely. Yes. Say that again. Yes, oh, is it, is it important to apply on that day? Um, no, but yes, in the same breath. All right. So yeah, no, it's not. You can apply, you know, middle of November if you want. That's fine. And you're going to be, but just understand that if you apply at a later date, when we public, we review them in the order they're received. So when we publish a new list in the new year, it's possible that your group might not be on that list yet because you were somewhat late getting it into our office for review. It'll eventually become part of that list as, every, as we update it uh, a couple times a week when we're really busy with approving applicants. Um, so you'll eventually make your way onto that list, odds are, but in the moment, you might not be on that list because it came in on November 20th instead of November 1st. Okay. So we, we recommend strongly to get it as close to November 1st as possible, but it's not as important as the business. Okay. Yes, so the question is, regards to renewal applications, are they available? They are. Yes, I know we've gotten a lot of inquiries. Um, over the last couple of weeks regarding the availability of the new guidelines, which include the application. And they were published right around the same date that we got the letters out. 
everything kind of came together and, and they are published out there um, both across the board for all, all types. So if it's a June 30 year end, you would be given one for June 30 of 18 and June 30 of 19. So it's 17, 18 and 18, 19. 1920 is still open and will remain till next year. So when you're reapplying in November 2020, that's when you'll do June 30 of 2020. Okay. And again, that's just a, a one-time thing to get us back on level. And then moving forward, it's just going to be one report. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, real quick on these. Uh, so the this is for OSTC, the Appendix 15. We got a lot of inquiries every year in regards to that last group of questions um, for the poverty level, first class school district, and school districts that are determined to be in financial distress. Um, it's been shortened a little bit. It used to be eight questions. It's now going to be six questions for this year. Questions number two, one and two pertain to Applications award 185% of the federal poverty level. This varies depending upon the size of the household. All right, family of four, that is the income for a family of four to be recognized as 185% of federal poverty level. Um, I found that number just by doing a quick Google search. So if you get hung up on a family of, you know, more or less in the household, uh, Google search of 185% of federal poverty level will produce a nice chart and you can easily come up with the figure for that family. Um, questions number three and four ask about the poverty level along with attendance of a first class school district. School District of Philadelphia is the only first class school district in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And when you're completing questions three and four, um, recognize that that is School District of Philadelphia public school students and that's where they would be um, required to attend public school if, if they were to be in a public school environment. And so one and two and three and four could certainly be the same answer. All right, just understand that when you're doing these documents, um, one and two, three and four can be the same. You could have every kid that got a scholarship meeting the 185% of poverty, and then also not only the poverty level, but then also being residing within the attendance boundaries. Okay. Questions number five and six, which are the final two questions on the appendix 15, ask about financial recovery school districts. And these are school districts that have been basically determined through PDE to be in financial distress. All right, they're they're accounting and they've almost been, I think, in most cases, taken over by the state to run their financials because they're in such, um, you know, um, dire straits and, and really struggling financially. Um, Chester Upland School District, Duquesne City School District, Harrisburg, Ken Hills, Scranton, and the city of York. So that makes a total of six. So when you're doing questions five and six, make sure you're accurately looking at where these students would be attending public school. Should they have to attend a public school? And if it's any of these particular school districts, they would be recognized as questions five and six, okay? Um, I can tell you that we're gonna be tasked more intently this year to make sure that these numbers are accurately depicted on the renewal applications. Um, in years past, if, if a number looks and it looks to, that it would make sense or it would legitimately be correct, our staff was, you move on. If, they, if someone got 50,000 and they said they spent 40,000 in the school district of Philadelphia, we took that as accurate because it makes sense. If it was higher, that's a problem, but, and we would move past and move on to the next applicant. Uh, because of, you know, some of the um, coverage that the programs have received, we, we do plan to maybe follow up and just confirm a lot of these numbers, not with everybody, but we just want to confirm to make sure that the numbers that are being reported are accurate. So, um, you know, be prepared. A lot of you have probably already dealt with our staff in the past, but be prepared that you may hear from our group um, in regards to just to confirm that these numbers are accurate. Uh, contact information, a lot of you probably are very familiar with the website. Um, both of them, EITC and OSTC, have our own website for each. Customer Service Center answers a lot of the questions related to the business process and the online application through our electronic single application in regards to, you know, I'm getting a screen, I don't remember my password, I'm getting blocked, I didn't complete this particular field, you know, what, what step can they help in there? And then the information down at the bottom, obviously myself, um, it's a direct line phone number. Probably a lot of you probably already have it. And that's my email address as well. You can certainly reach out to me, but everybody also has a uh, staffer in our office, particularly assigned an analyst, if you will, that assists directly um, with your EITC and OSTC matters. Questions I'm gonna answer yours real quick. I believe the group uh, organizing is gonna have it available, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, the only thing I, and I mentioned early on to the, to the group here, 
If you decide to you know, piggyback off some of the stuff and you want to plug it in, uh, this is all branded for our agency. So if you're going to you know, just take my, which is fine if you want to do that and you want to do it for your groups, and uh, please continue to use our branding and, and make sure it does recognize for DC. Okay? All right, I'm going to turn it on. I'll stick around as well, so a lot of you may have sidebar questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. We really appreciate what a wonderful uh, program this was for all of us today. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Aggie Malter, Executive Director of Pace Boa. Just want to call your attention to two things before we disperse. First of all, uh, we have the um, Pace Boa signature events. All of you are welcome to attend and uh, we'd love to see you come out for them. There's a, there are sheets out in the front. Um, we'll be sending out um, the survey, the slides, and the recording of today's presentation so that all of you will have that. Uh, it will also all be posted on the Pace Boa website for you. Uh, if you want to access it there as well. And one other plug for the Pace Boa Annual Data Survey, for those of you who have started it, yay. For those of you who haven't, get cracking. Uh, we have till the uh, beginning of October to uh, get those results in. Uh, you may be sad while you're doing it, but you'll be really happy when you get the results. So thank you all for coming today. And on behalf of um, Advis and Pace and Pace Boa, uh, we're so delighted to see all of you, and we're so happy to bring you this excellent programming. See you the next time.